Um, and I probably should have done a couple of slides on Tuesday. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get through all of this today. Um, we'll see how we go. Um, if I can stop my teeth from chattering because it's so cold in this classroom. Um, next Thursday is exam number one. Okay. So next Tuesday will be our review session. Um, and if I don't get completely finished today, we might do a couple of slides Tuesday before we start the review. Okay, but I'll do my best to get through everything today so that we've got a clean slate for questions and reviewing on Tuesday. All right. Um, so, chapter nine is looking at the development of body systems. Uh, some of the prenatal stuff I covered in chapter eight, so I might do that, you know, skim that a little bit, um, and then we'll look at what happens postnatally once the baby's born. So remember that body systems, when we look at our constraints triangle, that body systems would come under the section of individual structural constraints, okay? And that they can be influenced by extrinsic or external factors, all right? We talked about those teratogens with the fetus and the fact that they can have quite a dramatic effect on the baby, positively or negatively, all right? And that the reason we want to be looking at this information today is because as teachers, it's important that we understand what the typical pattern of growth would be and what the variations for an individual might be. Because then we can identify someone who is atypical and may need some intervention. Okay? All right, just a reminder of that term rate limiting that we covered. Um, remember that a rate limiter is a constraint, an individual constraint, and when we are looking early in the lifespan, it's going to be the system that is the slowest in developing that um, will act as a rate limiter for the next motor skill. All right. So an example of that would be strength in the legs, right? So to transition from walking to running, and remember that running has to have a flight phase, okay? So to transition from walking to running, we have to have enough strength in our legs to lift our body off the ground against gravity, okay? So strength would be the rate limiter to see running um, emerge. Does that make sense? Guys, remember I can't see you, so if I ask a question, it would really help if you would answer so that I know it's okay to move on or whether I need to repeat something. We're good to go. Okay, thank you. All right, so this chapter covers several systems, including the endocrine system. We are not going to do the endocrine system, so you can ignore that system when you're studying for the exam next week, all right? Um, there's only so much information you can absorb, and of all the systems, I think the endocrine one is the the least immediately useful to understand. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I view it. Um, so we're going to start with 
the skeletal system. All right, remember that I showed you the picture of the fetus that had the cartilage model and we saw those primary ossification centers at the middle of where the long bone was going to start growing. All right, when we have been born, um, now we see growth at the ends of the long bones. And these are called the secondary centers, okay. and they are our growth plates, is the kind of everyday term that we would use for them. The fancy term is the epiphyseal plate. All right. So for the bone to grow longer and for us to get taller, we have to lay down additional cells from the epiphyseal plate and then the bone gets longer. For the bone to get thicker, that is called appositional growth, and we lay cells down on the outsides to make the bones thicker and wider, which is a really good thing because that makes them really strong and hopefully less likely to break. So this laying down of the cells from the epiphyseal plate stops in response to either estrogen or testosterone building up in the body when we go into puberty. So we see our long bones, so our leg bones, our toes, our fingers, our arms, they all stop at slightly different times but they stop in response to the sex hormones building up within the system, okay? So typically, they're all shut by around 18, 19, um, a little bit earlier in girls, and possibly a bit later in boys, depending upon whether they're a late mature or not, okay? Remember that we said that girls mature faster than boys, so we see the closure. She goes into puberty earlier, and so we see closure at an earlier age for girls. All right, so that's another. That's part of the reason why they're shorter, right? Because their long bones stop growing earlier. Okay. So, you know, we tend to do things in school based on chronological age because that's a simple way of dividing kids up into classes and moving through, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, and then into college. But, you know, we, we have to bear in mind when we're teaching movement skills to these individuals that just because they're the same chronological age doesn't mean that we have the same um, developmental age in the systems. All right, we talked a little bit about that already. Um, obviously, we can't assess skeletal age without fancy equipment, so you know we just have to understand what is happening so that we can be careful with someone whose skeleton has not yet finished maturing, okay? So a hand and wrist x-ray is a typical um, assessment that would be done um, in a clinic, all right? And you can see on the left hand x-ray that this individual has not fully matured yet because the epiphyseal plate has not closed. Right, so you can see these fingers still have some growing to do. The end of the arm, that's quite a big epiphyseal plate there, that's still got, the arm is gonna get longer. And then the wrist bones, we don't even have all the wrist bones beginning to ossify yet, okay? 
If you look on the right hand side, this individual is almost fully mature. There's a couple of the epiphyseal plates aren't quite closed, um, but then they're, they're much more mature than the one on the left. Okay, and you can see there's a lot more development of the round bones that are in the wrist. So we have a couple of different types of bones. The round bones uh, develop in a slightly different way and the bones in our skull develop in a slightly different way. But when we're looking at these long bones, they, they lay down cells from this epiphyseal plate. Okay? It's really important that we understand that this is going on and we understand the kind of timeline Right? So we go back to that S growth curve that we looked at earlier. All right? Because the epiphyseal plate is quite um, delicate. All right? And if you um, exercise someone whose epiphyseal plate has not shut yet, you can damage that. Okay? Now, um, the the surgeries available for fixing epiphyseal plates are much more sophisticated nowadays than they used to be. Um, in the old days, if you slipped the epiphyseal plate off the end of the bone, that basically meant that bone was not going to grow anymore and you would end up with one short leg or one short arm. Okay? Um, these days they can go in and they can move it back and they can pin it down. They can do all kinds of clever things. So it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, a, a child is going to end up with a short arm or leg. But still it's a pretty dramatic injury and, and it requires surgery, right? Which is never a good plan. Okay? So we have to take particular care when we are training children whose skeleton has not finished developing and maturing. All right? Remember that we said that um, the legs are going to stop growing before the trunk. So if I'm keeping um, record of their growth, I should have an idea of when their long bones have finished. Right? skeleton as we get older. All right? Bone is quite an interesting tissue because unlike everything else except in the nervous system can regenerate a bit, but bone is always laying down new cells throughout our whole life. Okay? So the old bone gets absorbed back, we leach out the calcium and we use it for laying down new bone, okay? What happens as we get older though, is that that, that process gets skewed. And I, I get to a point where I'm absorbing bone faster than I'm laying new bones down to keep the long bone nice and thick and strong. All right, and that leads or can lead to osteopenia or osteoporosis. Okay, so um, the bone will start to become more brittle, and you can see here this is what a nice, dense, strong bone would look like. If you look at that same picture in someone with osteoporosis, these holes in the bone, the matrix, are much bigger and the, the kind of webbing is thinner, right? That puts that at much higher risk of breaking, okay? So, osteoporosis can lead to 
um, ribs collapsing because they just kind of turn almost to dust. It can reduce height because you start to stoop a little bit and it can also lead to wrist fractures, hip fractures that are quite, um, quite dangerous in the elderly population. So how much bone I lose as I get older is, can be somewhat influenced by my diet, by my um, physical activity levels, um, and my hormone levels, okay? So um, small white women are more at risk of developing osteoporosis than a big guy, right? Um, and we have to be concerned about that because Sadly, when we look at the data in the elderly, um, about 60-65% of elderly people who fall and break their hip do not survive for longer than one year. Okay? So the fall and the break don't kill them, it's the knock-on effects of the fall and the break that kill them. Because you know, you have to have surgery, you've got to do a load of rehab, you become very sedentary. Often, um, elderly people will develop bronchitis that turns into pneumonia, and then they don't survive the year, okay? So it is very worrying if I know that this is happening. And again, go back to our triangle. If I'm nervous, if I'm fearful, if I'm worrying, that is an individual functional constraint. So, adding that constraint means that we would expect to see a different motor pattern emerge. Okay? So watch elderly people. How do they move? Okay? How cautious are they when they're moving around? What's changed in their motor pattern? Because they know if they fall and break their hip, that's a problem, right? Questions? No. No? Okay. All right, system number two is gonna be looking at our muscles. All right, so I think I mentioned in the fetus, the muscles are growing both by hyperplasia, which is adding extra cells, and hypertrophy, which is making the cells bigger. All right, and so the muscles get longer and fatter, okay? Once we're born, things change, okay? We no longer lay down new muscle cells. The growth in the muscle that we see once we're born is due to the cells that are there getting bigger, okay? So it's hypertrophy that is occurring postnatally, all right? Same as the other systems, we would expect to see somewhat of a S-shaped growth curve for the muscles, and they can increase in diameter, and they can increase in length by adding a unit we call a sarcomere. Right? The muscular system um, is quite dramatically different post-puberty in boys and girls. All right? So testosterone, is a stimulant for muscle growth. And because girls don't release as much testosterone as boys, post-puberty we see boys typically have much larger muscle mass, all right? So just a little bit about um, the muscle fibers, we do a lot more about this in exercise physiology. So if you haven't had that yet, you've got that coming. Okay, 
adult muscle has um, two general divisions. It's either type 1 or type 2. Under the type 2 umbrella, we have type 2A and type 2X. Um, if you are looking at an older resource, type 2X is used to be called type 2B, right? But that's, that's not current. Now we have A's and X's. X's are really fast. A's are somewhat fast. Type 1's are slow. Okay? That's a very big simplification, but that's the easiest way to approach it. Right? What's interesting about the muscular system is that when we are born, only about 15%, and I've seen this number lower in certain resources, are undifferentiated. That means that the majority of my muscle when I'm born is already type 1 or type 2. There's very little left that has to differentiate into type 1 or type 2, and that is typically complete by the age of 1. Okay. Again, this is a really important idea to get our head around because um, we tend to make the mistake of thinking, well, if I train hard, I can get faster, right? Or if I train hard, I'll be able to run a marathon in two and a half hours, okay? The problem is, that unless you have the right fiber type to do those activities, it doesn't matter how hard you train. You'll never, you'll never achieve that goal, right? Which is a little disappointing, but it's important, again, when we're the teacher, that we're able to explain this to people because people set goals that are unattainable. And if I don't attain the goal, I'm not having fun I'm not motivated to keep moving, and I quit, right? So it's really important that we set appropriate goals based upon not just my motivation and my, my desire, but also on my body type, right? If I don't have lots of type 1 fibers, then I'm not, if I have a lot of type 2 fibers, I can't run a marathon in two and a half hours. If I have a lot of type 2 fibers, I can run 100 meters really fast. If I have a lot of type 1 fibers, I can't run 100 meters really fast. It doesn't matter how hard I work. Right? So again, you know, it might seem strange that we're spending time looking at the systems, but there, it's important to understand what is happening if I want to be a good teacher of motor skills, right? I have just a really quick question, Dr. Walsh. Sure, Walter. absolutely. Okay, so going back to the muscular system and muscular, uh, muscle fiber types, uh -huh. if you have, say, a child who's recovering from, like, sarcoma, how does this work when you're like their PE teacher and they just had like procedure done per se and they are developed as fast as other kids? Like how are the muscle fibers and how are their um, sarcomeres recovering? They're still going through treatments right now. How are they compared to a kid who wasn't like diagnosed with like sarcoma, something like that? Probably, um, depending upon the treatment and things, they're likely to be delayed. So they're going to be, um, we mentioned the other day that idea of catch up in growth and development if the system is stressed for some reason. So I would imagine that if they have had that kind of surgery, that their muscular system is going to be behind where it should be on their curve. 
and that they'll need a period of catch up once they've fully recovered to get back to their curve. And I guess depending on how heavy the treatment is, they may not ever fully meet their potential. It wouldn't impact their type one and type two. It would just impact that hypertrophy and that growth and development and maturation of those fibers. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah. I'm curious about that because I didn't know if if they were diagnosed early enough, or could you detect that prenatally if you're trying something that could hurt their um, their muscular system or harm their fiber types? Because I know that's what um, sarcoma is coming from. Yeah, and I'm not sure if they can detect sarcoma that early. I don't know very much about it. I have to admit. But it's a fascinating question, so now I might have to go home and find out some more about it. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love it when, when people ask questions, I'm like, well, I think this, but I'll have to go and check. Um, the ratio of type 1 to type 2 fibers is different amongst individuals. In an average person, it's around 50-50. So that means that an average person is okay at running fast and okay at running for a long time, but not great at either of them, right? When we watch people who are great, they are a little bit freakish in their physiology, right? start to look at the other end of the lifespan, all right? If I exercise regularly, <laughs> if I'm physically active, right, then we can maintain muscle mass well during our adult years until we get into our 50s. Once we hit our 50s, um, we start to lose muscle mass the harder I train, the less I lose, but it doesn't ever, it can't stop me losing muscle mass. So, right, I'm 50, what year is this? 20, I'm 57, I can't remember that old. I'm 57 now, and I can, it's quite dramatic in the last five years how much harder it is to maintain muscle mass, right? It's dramatic. You know, and things that you used to be able to pick up and carry that were easy, it's now getting a little bit tricky, right? It's getting harder. So by 80, if we make it that far, then we've lost, the average person has lost about 30% of their muscle. Remember though what we said on Tuesday, right? And that picture of that older gentleman, right? If we train, if we do resistance work, if we do aerobic work, we see far less deterioration in these systems than if we are sedentary. Okay. Generally, what's happening um, in our 50s, we start to lose the number of muscle fibers and the research suggests that we lose more type 2 fibers than type 1 fibers. So one of the reasons we slow down, even if we exercise, is because we're losing those fast twitch fibers, okay? And then, as we get older, with the muscle fibers also start to decrease in size, okay? And I don't know, but I've always wondered whether the decrease in size is because because, you know, once you hit kind of 70 or so, generally you don't have the same sort of appetite that you had when you were younger, so you don't eat as much, um, and maybe you're not getting enough protein. 
um, to maintain muscle fiber size? I don't know because this is not my area of research. So, you know, if I'm going to stop and read, it generally isn't about muscle fiber size. But it, it's always an interesting thought to me that that might be part of the problem. Do we want, as we get older, to, to take more protein supplement? I don't know the answer to that. So when you are, when you're reviewing this material and you're thinking about it, but keep bearing in mind my constraints triangle, right? How does the interaction of these systems impact what I'm seeing from a movement perspective, all right? And remember that we had said um, Tuesday or last week that when we hit puberty, the skeleton grows first and then we put muscle mass on, okay? So what happens is, you know, when you hear people talking about growing pains, that's a real thing, right? Particularly if a child's skeleton does a huge fast spurt, right? Because my muscle is attached to that skeleton at either end, and the muscle isn't growing yet, right? So the muscle gets stretched like crazy, and that causes pain. Okay. Also though, pulling on the muscle stimulates it to start laying down these sarcomere units and getting longer and bigger. Right? So if the skeleton didn't grow first, there wouldn't be a reason for that muscle to get longer. Right? It's the stretch, the stress, that we apply to the muscle during puberty that stimulates the growth of the muscle. Alright, where are my time wise? Oh, we're going to be fine, I think, she says. 10.02. What have I got? I've got till 10.45. I think we're going to be good. We're going to be good. Okay, next system is our adipose system, so all those lovely fat cells, all right? Um, in the fetus, uh, adipose tissue um, appears initially around three and a half months, so just after we've gone into the second trimester. Um, it doesn't lay down a lot of adipose tissue until month eight, and then in month eight and nine, it's rapidly putting on um, fat cells, right? So if you watch someone who's pregnant, they stay relatively small, relatively small, relatively small, and then monthly, all of a sudden, belly pops out, right? Because the baby does a huge amount of growing in those last eight weeks. Even so, when they're born, the adipose tissue only makes up about half a kilo, um, so a pound. So on average, babies are around seven, seven and a half pounds. Only about a pound of that is down to fat cells. Then it goes berserk once we're born, right? Fat is um, a really beneficial tissue. It tends to get a bad rap, and particularly in movement circles because we think of it as being um, unsightly or it slows us down or, you know, um, but we need fat, right? We have a lot of organs in our trunk that need protection we need to be able to maintain our core body temperature um, and fat holds a lot of energy. So there's several benefits to adipose tissue, right? Once we're born, for the first six months, those adipose cells are growing rapidly. We're laying down 
some cells until around eight, right? When we go into puberty, sadly for many girls, because their heads are a little bit skewed about fat, right? Estrogen stimulates an increase in the size of the fat cells. Testosterone doesn't. So as we go through puberty, we see the boys put on more muscle mass and the girls put on more fat mass. If they're active, right, during puberty, they'll, they won't put on as much fat mass, okay? So up until we finish with puberty, growth of these adipose cells is both hyperplasia, I add more cells in, and hypertrophy, the cells get bigger and they fill up with fat. So adipose cells work a little bit like a water balloon, right? So I've got the balloon and then I pour the water in and the balloon stretches and gets bigger. That's what happens with an adipose cell, right? It's sitting there and then we add fat to the cell and it gets bigger, right? So when we look at fat, we talk about um, a general division of, into two types. We have visceral fat, which is the fat that is wrapped around our organs and helps to keep us warm inside our trunk. And then we have subcutaneous fat, which is the stuff that's under your skin that you can grab hold of, right? Until puberty, children typically developing children. This is not what we're seeing now, right? What we're seeing now is children who are overweight, severely overweight and obese. That's a different picture, right? We're talking about a healthy, typical child here, okay? So, when they're younger, children have more internal fat, visceral fat, than subcutaneous fat, and then as they move through elementary school, they start to increase in subcutaneous fat. How much of that they put down is directly linked to their diet and their exercise, okay? And then we get to puberty, right? And so, yeah, as I said, in puberty, girls are going to lay down more subcutaneous fat than boys do, healthy girls and boys. Um, and, um, you know, they just, they just are going to have a higher fat percentage, period, right? A girl cannot have really, really low fat percentage like a guy can. It's just not genetically possible. Then we have a problem, right? Because I said that they act a bit like a water balloon. The problem with adipose tissue and adipose cells is that once they are laid down, they're permanent can't get rid of them unless you have liposuction, right? So if we look at the fact that children are able to lay down extra cells, we need to help manage that because those cells are never going to go away. Right? If I have a bigger pantry, I can stuff more food into it, right? If I keep the pantry small, then I can't put a lot in there. Right? So when we look at fat cells, I want as few fat cells as is genetically normal, right? So that if I happen to overeat 
and not exercise for a short period of time, I don't have piles of space to add extra fat to. Right? So, what's interesting about when we look at adults and fat cells is that when we put on weight as an adult, right? So we often talk about freshman, freshman 10, freshman 15. Go ahead. Is it freshman 10 or freshman 15? 15. 15, right? So they talk about the freshman 15. A lot of people come to college, it's the first time they've bought food for themselves, it's the first time they've cooked for themselves, and a lot of them put on some weight during that first year, right? When we go out to work from college, a lot of people put on weight during their first couple of years at a full-time job, particularly if the full-time job is sedentary, not if their full-time job is roofing or landscaping, right? But for many people, their job ends up being something where they're sedentary, okay? When we look at that, from a development and development perspective, what's happening when we put on weight is that we are taking those extra calories and we are filling up our water balloons. Right? To become obese or severely overweight, we have to stress the system so hard that it goes against its genetic disposition, which is not to lay down additional cells as an adult, right? Genetically, as an adult, we should not be seeing hyperplasia, just hypertrophy, or preferably not hypertrophy, right? But what happens when we stress the system so much because the imbalance of our calorie intake and our calorie output is so high, then the body will actually start to lay down additional fat cells in an adult. Right? So someone who is obese has thousands more fat cells than someone who is typical. Again, go back to the idea that once those cells are there, they're permanent. Right? It's important because that means it's really, really, really difficult for someone who is obese to lose weight and keep it off. Because the pantry is just sitting there with the doors open waiting to get filled up again. Right? One quick question, Dr. Wolf. Sure. Okay, so if there's people that they feel like are severely overweight and choose to have the gastric bypass surgery or the sleeve put around their stomach, mm -hmm. can you explain like what that would have to do with their adipose tissue? Yes, yeah, so when they do the gastric bypass, what they do, my, my limited understanding is that they basically um, prevent the body from breaking down any foodstuffs and absorbing the nutrients from that food and the calories from that food. And so what, what, it, what I understand is that, that that puts the body into a controlled state of starvation and then it will start to utilize, because fat holds so much energy, it will, it will start to utilize stored fat to drive muscle contraction, to keep you warm, to keep your heart beating, and all these other jobs. Um, the problem with that surgery is that 
to maintain that weight loss, you have to have a change in lifestyle, right? And what we see in the literature is that many people who have the bypass don't change their lifestyle, and so eventually they put weight back on again. Same with liposuction, right? You can suck out some of these water balloons so they're not there, right? But if you don't change your life and you go back to the lifestyle that caused hyperplasia to happen in the first place, it'll happen again. Right? We have to change the lifestyle, the habits of these people. That's, in my mind, the key. And, you know, I mean, in, in fairness, I don't work with that population. Um, you know, it's just when you look at physiology, the only way to maintain a healthy body fat percentage is to make sure that calories in and calories out are relatively well balanced. Now, there are individuals who have genetic issues, right? Obesity is massively complicated. We have um, social training, you know, you've got familial habits that it's very difficult to break because those are what you've grown up with. Um, we've got our motor problem, you know, because once I'm heavy, it's harder to get good at motor skills. And if I'm not good at them, then I don't want to do them and I become more sedentary, right? We also have, um, there are some genetic issues for some people. It's not just a calorie imbalance. It's things like um, the, the enzyme that helps to break down fat is called lipase, and they just don't produce enough lipase. And so it's easier for their body to lay down fat because it does. It's harder to break it up and use it for energy. So it's it's a really massively complicated problem. Um, but if we start, this is why I like to work with the little kids, right? If we get them competent and active when they're young and they enjoy moving, then they'll move more as they get older, right? And then maybe we can prevent this imbalance from occurring in the first place. She says, hopefully, I don't know. Um, as we get older and older, then you might see more trunk fat. Now that trunk fat is an issue because it's more linked to type 2 diabetes. Trunk fat is genetically uh, laid down more easily by men than by women. So this visceral fat, men tend to have more visceral fat than women. And that visceral fat is much more linked with type 2 diabetes. So we see more men develop type 2 diabetes than we do women, right? So it's interesting when you're walking around the supermarket, you know, have a look at just an eyeball waist to hip ratio, right? If I'm a man, my waist should be about the same width as my hips. If I'm a woman, it's going to be typically a little bit less than my hips, right? What happens when we walk around Walmart, right? We see all these people whose waists are out here and whose hips are in here. That is a very bad sign from a health outcome point of view. Dr. Bob. Yes. It's well, fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> it is. You've got, you've got the bug, I can tell. Kind of like thinking about was 
what is it like when a woman delivers her child and she's going through postpartum like recovery and she wants to get like working out and everything mm -hmm. how does adipose tissue now do when she was pregnant because i know like a lot of pregnant women after they give birth to their child they won't ever look the same as like they did um before they did right i know some women will exercise like throughout their pregnancy and then afterward, it's a lot easier for them to recover. So yeah. how does that deal with the, um, your body fat percentage and things of that sort? Yeah. Um, part of it is if you exercise all through the pregnancy, you don't lay down as much extra fat. You know, the, the, when you're pregnant, the body is stimulated to have all these extra energy available, right? Because when, when this baby's born, you have to feed it genetically, right? So we're, we're built to, to be able to feed this child. So the, the, the stimulation is to lay down additional fat stores because feeding that baby takes a huge amount of energy, right? So if I exercise regularly during pregnancy, then I, what you tend to see is we don't put on as much fat as if we're sedentary during the pregnancy. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, controversy over, you know, I want to get back in shape so I'm not going to breastfeed, so I can get rid of this fat quickly. On the other hand, if you breastfeed, you lose that fat pretty quickly as well, right? Um, so that's always a difficult argument, I think, for people. Um, some of the shape change is due to um, the change in the width of the hips. Right? During pregnancy, the, all the ligaments that support the hip girdle get squishy so that that hip girdle can expand as the baby gets bigger. So sometimes that doesn't completely go back to where it started. And so they have slightly wider hips than they did before they were pregnant. That can happen. Um, you know, some of it is just making the time to train that hard when you have a baby. Right? You know, especially if you have a baby who doesn't sleep very well. <laughs> um, you know, I think those are factors that play a bigger role in what you see happen than the body can't go back to the way it was. Does that make sense? That makes a lot more sense. Now, I was just always hearing before, I'm not from an educational perspective, but that once a woman does have the baby, her body won't ever go back to how it was before, but I don't necessarily believe that. No, no. I mean, if you, I mean, just look at ballet dancers that have had babies, you know, I mean, they're still 10, 12% body fat when they're on stage. Um, you know, it's, and, and marathon runners, I mean, it's, yeah, it's much more down to lifestyle choices than it is genetics.
and that the development of the nervous system is strongly driven by the genetic makeup of the baby. All right? um, extrinsic factors can alter that. Right? So the migration and the branching and the pruning of these nerve cells can be impacted by external factors. Right, so that's partly why we see babies, uh, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome babies have smaller brains. Okay. Um, most of our nervous tissue is formed by the fourth month prenatally and it's pretty complete by month six. So they migrate once they're there, then they start putting out axons and dendrites so that they can talk to other nerve cells. And we start to see electrical impulses in the system um, randomly. So the baby will start, you know, back kicking or punching. That's okay never been pregnant but I've watched my friends go through that and the baby like punches them in the kidney. Ooh, lovely. And um, you know and so some of that is initially random and then we start to see some deliberate patterns, not voluntary, but deliberate patterns of firing within the system. When we're born, the size of my brain rapidly increases. All right? We lay down not new nerve cells because all the nerve cells are already there, but what happens to increase the size is all the synapses, right? all the connections, um, the glial tissue that, that provides nutrients. Uh, myelination of motor nerves, so we start to see fatty substance around the nerves. Okay. Um, when we look at myelination, remember our two laws of direction. All right. So myelination of the motor nerves occurs from the head down to the feet, and from the midline out to the periphery. Right? Well, once the motor nerve is myelinated, it can carry the signal from the central nervous system up to 150 times faster. Right? So as my arms and then my fingers get myelinated, I get much more control over what they can do. Okay? So the size of the neurons, we see hypertrophy of the neurons in the brain, but not hyperplasia, right? We see branching from the nerves, from the dendrites and the axon to form synapses with other neurons, right? And what the early childhood research shows quite strongly, which I think is really fascinating, is that the more we stimulate that little one's brain, the more synaptic connections we see made within that brain. All right? Then at around nine or 10, the brain will start to prune the synaptic connections that don't get used, and it'll just reabsorb them. All right? So it's really important that we give them as much experience as possible when they're pre-puberty so that we can make as many connections between all these different areas of the brain as we can. other end of the lifespan, we start to see a loss of the nerve cells, the neurons, the synapses can deteriorate, the dendrites kind of 
fade away. Um, we, we see a decrease in the number of neurotransmitters. So a neurotransmitter is a chemical that aids the um, conduction of the electrical impulse from the central nervous system out to the organ via the peripheral system. Okay. And in our motor nerves, the myelin breaks down. So that slows down the signal from the brain to the muscle. And so we see slower reactions to things. Right? One of the theories of aging within the uh, nervous system is that we see breaks in these links and then the, the central nervous system still wants to send a signal there and it has to take a big detour to get there. Right? That's one theory that we see. We know that exercising promotes cognitive function. Right? So it's not just we've got to keep stimulating it all the time, otherwise these synapses die away. Right? So, so reading, doing crosswords, um, you know, playing games, any of that kind of cognitive work will will help to maintain connections in the brain, but also exercise improves cognitive function. Partly because you get more oxygen and glucose to the brain, partly because we see an improvement in the level of brain proteins that are available to mend anything that's, that's you know, deteriorating. So, Keeping active, right, is really key. So think of people you know who are older who are still mentally sharp. You know, what do they do that helps them maintain cognitive function? Right? Think of someone who's older, who's a bit kind of out of it. What do they do? or not do. Okay, keep thinking about the interaction, about our constraints model, right? Which systems interact? We already mentioned the fact that the muscular system is stimulated and grows in response to the stretch put on it by the growth in the skeletal system. Right? So get just all the time you're looking at it, just keep thinking, how does this, how does my constraints theory work with this? Right? If I see this change occur in this person, what might I see occur in their motor skill? Okay. That's good. I wasn't sure I could get through all that. I hope I didn't go too fast for you. Um, but that does mean that next Tuesday we can really do a good job of reviewing the chapters for the exam. All right. It's not my job to reteach you everything we've covered up to this point, okay? So I'm here to help you study. I'm here to answer questions, all right? Don't leave it until Tuesday to start studying, okay? You need to look at some of this material over the weekend so that on Tuesday you can come with questions and say, I thought I understood this and now I look at it and I don't understand it. Can you explain? Right? I'll have some questions and um, maybe a couple of activities for you to do to help you study, right? But you know, now this is your baby now, right? Take it and run with it. Okay. Remember that the only way we learn is to practice. Okay. So 
Now it's time to start practicing. Okay? Any questions before we close for the day? No. No? Anybody else? No. No? All right. Tomorrow in lab, we're going to look at some BMI information and how we calculate BMI and what does it represent and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And then it will be the weekend. <laughs> All right, guys. See you tomorrow.